all these things and go ahead. And then he has to deal with the tax situation where if the subscription or the monthly per unit collection is more than 7,500 rupees from a particular unit, then it is liable to GST. So now he has to convince all these people saying that, look, what you're paying will attract GST because we are calculating square foot rate and square foot rate out of 25 flats, 12 flats comes to 9,000 rupees per month. So on those 12 flats, I have to put GST. I'm not putting, I'm required to put. Then there's a big debate, big fight saying that, no, no, why should GST come on business welfare associations? My answer is this simple. It should not come, but it is there. So a residential welfare association is very much liable to GST if the amount collected from a unit is in excess of is more than rupees 7,500. And this nullification of the doctrine of mutuality virtually nullifies that argument saying that the welfare association is also mutuality. That argument collapses on account of this amendment. Ideally, they should leave the association alone because what is the association doing? It is only collecting money and that secretary is not keeping it in his pocket. He's collecting the money, pulling it and then paying to the AMC fellow, paying to the lift fellow, paying to the water fellow, paying to the uh, gardening fellow, paying to the landscape fellow, you know, paying all these things. It's only a collective pool. It is only spreading. It's like, you know, 20 friends decide to go together on a holiday. And then one of them takes the responsibility saying that all of you give me money, I'll collect. And then I'll incur all the travel costs. I'll incur all the hotel costs on our behalf. And then the, they make the trip. Now, there is no service between that person who collects uh, from all of them and providing service to the rest of the 19. But unfortunately, the law is what it is. And therefore, there is a tax on the transaction. Thank you, sir. So there's a question from Sabina. Uh, Sabina, would you like to unmute and ask yourself? She is there. I just saw Hello, good yeah. evening, sir. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to ask, how does uh, GST work when we are doing white label? For example, if I'm getting uh, or buying something as white label and reselling in my brand name, uh, uh, if there is something which I am manufacturing and want to give it as a white label to uh, someone else. See, whether you change the label or put your own product line or whether you rebrand it or whether you repack it or whatever you do it, ultimately your transaction is a supply. So somebody has already supplied to you at let us say 100 rupees and then you are supplying it further in the market at whatever, let us say 200 rupees. So the 200 rupees being your selling price on that 200 rupees, you'll have to pay GST as applicable at the, at the rate applicable to that commodity. And of course, if your vendor has raised a proper invoice and charged the GST on his supply, you'll be able to take the input tax credit on the transaction and use it for set off. So the earlier complex laws of uh, pre-GST as to whether relabeling amounts to manufacture or rebranding amounts to manufacture all have collapsed. They're not relevant now. All you have to see is whether there's a supply. Yes, there is a supply. Is there a supply for consideration? Yes, there is a supply for consideration. Then it is taxable. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, thank Nandu, you so much, sir. Uh, Nandagopal, if you're here, you can ask the question yourself. Retail segment is any of the wasted in form of broken items. Go ahead, Nandagopal. Yeah. Yes sir, good yes, sir. Good evening. Actually, that's what, sir, like... Uh, so generally, in retail shops and all, there will be many wastages, right? So how to treat that? Because it is like self-consumed or it is reached to end user. So it, it is it is consumed in any form of the way. Whether that, What about the ITC that we have taken in the purchases? That we need to revert it or we need to charge a separate invoice? Or we can simply leave it? Uh, how to treat those items? What do you deal with? The, how do you deal with the waste items? Oh, so maybe it is just a waste of, like maybe so if, I, if I get some bottle, it is simply broken kind of thing or maybe I am consuming for myself or like that. So anyhow, that inventory is uh, gone out from my control, something like that. See, the if you look at the CGST Act, it talks about scenarios where ITC will have to be reversed. And one of the scenarios is a particular clause called as 17.5H where it talks about lost or destroyed. Now, if goods are lost or destroyed, it talks about ITC reversal. But we have always taken the view that lost or destroyed must is something which results on account of an event which is not in my control. For example, if I've stocked inventory, if I've stocked raw materials, if I've stocked goods at a particular location and there is flood or there is an earthquake, or there is a tsunami, or there is a fire accident. 
as a result of which the goods are lost or destroyed, then ITC will have to be reversed. But if in the course of business, if in the course of process of manufacturing, if in the course of trading, if in the course of carrying out my normal business activities, something happens and there is a loss, then it may be possible to take a view that 17.5H does not apply based on certain judgments. It is easy to for a manufacturer to say that this loss happened during course of manufacture compared to a trader. For example, let us let me give you an example. Let us say this, this is a metal plate. And this metal plate is kept in the factory, uh, in, the, in the assembly line. And uh, one person is operating a particular machine where he presses a button. So when he presses a button, something comes from the top and comes down slowly and makes out three identical holes in this metal plate. And the assembly line keeps moving. He moves the next plate, presses the button again, and again, those holes happen and keeps on moving. So there are every minute he does some five, uh, 10 plates, 20 plates, etc. Now, while doing this monotonous routine job, he suddenly gets slightly distracted. And when he gets distracted, he keeps the metal plate in a different alignment than the normal alignment. And therefore, the, the holes that are supposed to happen properly will not happen as per the design. And there's a half hole in between. Now, automatically what happens, there is a line rejection. So this, this metal plate is chunked off from the assembly line and falls down into a, tray, in, into a tray where it is picked up as scrap, either sold as scrap or taken back to the smelter, melted again, and then made as a plate again and used it forward. Now, this is a input which is lost in the course or in the process of manufacture. There is no necessity for reversal. But before the steel plates are put into place, if the steel plates are lost because of an, some kind of a, an accident beyond your control, then there is a reversal required. Now, whether the same analogy can be extended to retail trade, that can be tricky. Because in retail trade, what happens? You're stocking materials. So while stocking materials, why are you stocking materials? For the purpose of display. Only if the products are displayed, goods can be sold. The customer has to see the product. Customer has to look at the, the product, has to beckon the customer. And therefore, the customer picks up the product and buys the product. So while keeping there, something falls down and there is a breakage. Now, this is nothing but usage breakage. This is a loss that happens in the course of business. This is not an external event which is contemplated for under the 75 hertz. But if it is something which is before being put into use, expiry date has come and therefore you cannot sell it at all and therefore you're destroying that product, then that becomes an input which is not even put into use and cannot be put into use. You may have to reverse the input tax credit on that. Thank you, sir. Imanshu, you have a lot of questions you have put in. So I leave it to you. Can you start with one question now? Then we'll give chance to others. Go ahead, Imanshu. Sophie, can you talk for him? I think he, Himanshu Bhai has some uh, talk, uh, stammering issues. So I think Sophie. Yeah, will okay. We, we can ask one question. Uh, if I have forgotten to cancel the e invoice and 24 hours have passed, uh, passing CN is a better issue or amending the auto generated e GSTR1 is better? Credit note is a better. Credit note is better. Okay. Then next question from Himanshu. I have paid to the supplier after 180 days whether the GST ITC uh, uh, will be disallowed for the month in which I have claimed the GST or the department will collect only the interest for the period crossing 180 days and actual payment. See, this is a very peculiar requirement in GST whereby if I buy from a vendor or a service provider, I am supposed to pay the vendor or service provider the value of goods as well as the GST charge within 180 days. Therefore, I avail the credit, but I don't pay the vendor the value of the goods or the, value, the GST portion. Then on the 180th day, I must reverse the input tax credit and there is an interest consequence also. But I pay, I pay that fellow on the 220th day. Subsequently, I make the payment. On that day when I make the payment, I can take back the input tax credit. So this is the requirement to ensure that smaller vendors get their collections at least in 180 days. Okay. Uh, I, I think we have one more question from him. My transporter has not shown the LR in the GST part. The transporter registered under GST. Whether can I claim ITC after making the payment of RCM or for taking the ITC of RCM pay? Should I need to wait till the transporter files his return 
and shows the LR under RCM in view of the recent changes applicable from uh, 1122. See, 1122 affects suppliers in forward charge mechanism. So, if uh, if you are buying from a supplier, his filing of GSTR 1 is critical for you to avail the ITC in your GSTR 2B. But in a reverse charge mechanism, you yourself are going to pay the GST. Your chalan is the payment proof of payment of tax. Your self-invoice is the document for credit. Therefore, the amendment doesn't affect you for RCM. Oh. Okay, there's a question from Brahma. Would you like to ask yourself, Brahma, since you're here? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, basically, we would like to know how does ITC applies to goods imported, like for example, uh, let us say we are into the business of uh, like edible oils for biodiesel production, like uh, we import either palm oil or use cooking oil or palm acid oils, like there is some import charges applicable to these goods. So how does, how, how do we cover this? Uh, without passing on to the final product or to the customers. Is there a way to do it? You're talking about the oil getting imported into India and subsequently sold. That's right, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, the oil that is imported to India would attract IGST on imports because they are goods per se. And therefore, it would attract uh, IGST on the transaction. And uh, in case you have customs clearances, etc., paperwork, documentation work, etc., the service provider would have done some kind of services and also charge GST on the transaction. But all of them would be available to you as input tax credit. So if you are importing for, let us say, uh, 100 rupees and you have paid uh, 5 rupees as IGST, and then uh, some other fellow has charged you services for 20 rupees and has charged you 3.6 rupees as, as GST, you have got about 8.6 rupees as input tax credit and your expenditure so far is upon, on, on 120 rupees. And then you have a margin on the transaction and then you have a selling price. And on the selling price, you're required to pay GST. And therefore, whatever ITC that you have availed on your imports and your local procurements is available to you like a bank balance for paying this GST. So if your selling price is 200 rupees and you're paying 5% GST on that, you need to pay 10 rupees GST and you already have about 8.6 rupees credit of GST. 1.4 you'll pay us from your electronic cash or cash payment. And any event, you'll collect 10 rupees GST from the customer. And while paying to the government alone, you will use your input tax credit like a bank account debit. So this yeah. will be exclusive of import taxes, right? Yeah, because the, the custom customs duty is separate, GST is separate, GST is fully available as a credit. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks. Rajesh, a question uh, would you like to ask yourself? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, I'm Rajesh Priyadarsi from uh, Indian Oil Corporation, Ahmedabad. Uh, actually, sir, we have taken one land on long-term lease in 2015 when GST was not applicable. Uh, uh, it, actually, the uh, lease term is for 50 years. We had made an upfront uh, premium uh, of about 5 crores. Thereafter, now we are not making any payment uh, on regular basis. That only upfront upfront premium was applicable in the, this deal. So we have we had made that payment, and now actually our laser is raising the invoice of the amount uh, which is being amortized as per his books of account, and he is charging GST from us yeah. only GST, nothing else. So are we liable to pay that GST? I've heard of uh, much more complex situations, but uh, this is interesting. First of all, to, uh, the, the simple answer to your uh, the trade body, the body probably development corporation in Gujarat or GIDC or somebody, uh, what, whatever they do is that the most of the state government bodies or development corporations mm -hmm. encourage industry by giving long-term leases of 50 years, 60 years, 99 years, etc. And the whole philosophy of that is that, look, we are giving you land for an upfront payment. The upfront payment is called as salami, premium, or whatever name called. And mm -hmm. the whole beauty is that it is that big figure that has to be paid for you to get the right to use the land for 50 years or 90 years, mm -hmm. as, as the case may be. Now, mm -hmm. that event has already happened in the pre-GST era. So yeah. the consideration has already passed in the pre-GST era. 
the lease transaction or the long term lease being conferred on you has already passed during the pre gst era and there is no consideration that is payable in the gst era so in the absence of a consideration you cannot levy any gst because supply for consideration is the taxable event for gst and there is no fresh supply post gst period and hence charging of gst by treating the balance of 45 years in the gst period is not a right right approach to the uh, law okay okay thank you thank you in uh, actually the same replied we had made to that party thank you very much sir thank you thank you arthigayan you would like to ask the question yourself Sir, uh, good evening, uh, Karthik here. Yeah. You were uh, speaking about this um, GSTR uh, ITC, which is applicable from first Jan, uh, sir. Uh, so now this is effectively for uh, December month uh, GST, which is to be filed in Jan, or uh, for uh, return to be filed for the month of January, which is due in February. Sir. Before you, I, before I answer that question, I will also like to explain a, a bit of nuance in this. See if you look at some of the conditions for input tax credit that flows from sixteen two. I would read those conditions in two boxes. One, conditions at the time of availment, and conditions post availment. So conditions at the time of availment means if these two are not there, you cannot even take credit. One, I have to receive the goods, physically receive the goods. Two, I must receive the invoice. so these are conditions at the time of availment before taking credit itself i must check whether these two are there then the third condition payment of tax by the supplier or filing of gstr 1 by the supplier that i would read as a post availment condition why today is january 15 you have received goods you have received invoice you want to take credit your supplier may not be required to file the return any time now he will file it later he could be in the quarterly scheme where he may file after 3 months or he may delay the return because he does not have the cash to pay therefore they are post availment conditions and not pre availment conditions this is the first point of clarification second the amendment itself is effective from january 1st law itself has changed drastically from january 1st so obviously it's a prospective amendment therefore going forward for goods procured from january 1st onwards you apply this post availment test and then follow up with your suppliers so if you are business, if there are business people on the call what i would advise you is to implement a system called as green red orange do a vendor profile do a service provider profile and out of the vendor service providers categorize some of the vendors under green how do you categorize under green these guys are always prompt they always deliver the material on time they are good in terms of quality they are good in terms of compliance long relationships you, have, you know that they are in the highest they are also in the growth path they are also in the growth path they are clearly green and you can take the credit fully on the assumption that they will file their returns they'll pay the tax right these are the guys who know that you you also know that they'll play trant they won't deliver in time they won't file their returns they won't raise invoices they will they will make all kinds of errors in the documentation they will not be that good in terms of compliance you are forced to deal with them because of political compulsions or legacy issues you have a you, you have a long term relationship with them because of some other relationship which are which had happened in the past you can't get rid of this person but you have to deal with the person so you know very well that this person is not going to pay his taxes in time or file his returns in time put him under red category that means don't avail credit then the oh. orange would be some of those guys who are having some small difficulties in understanding the law or having some problems in understanding the provisions coach them train them compel them to file the returns so that they move from orange to green so if you do some kind of vendor profiling of green red and orange you can do a fairly decent itc credit management thank you sir so i have a connected question in this suppose you know i am buying from a supplier and you know i pay for invoice in full with gst i think my colleague vincent can tell you more about this I, and that guy decides to uh, file the return only once a quarter that means i'm going to be in a negative cash flow right no you that is what i said you should see it as a post availment condition filing the credit ensure that he files that quarterly return don't wait for him to file quarterly return ah. okay 
you are entitled otherwise is 180 days if you remember one of the questions was what happens if i don't pay the vendor within 180 days that itself the law itself understands that you can avail the credit and pay the fellow within 180 days therefore they can't, they can't say wait for him to file the return okay, okay. but don't you have to match the uh, vendor paying the duty and tax and then you're taking credit of it sorry no when you say that it uh, Vendor is only uploading his return once in a quarter. Uh, when the government is reconciling the tax availed and tax paid, there will be a mismatch, isn't it? No, this doesn't happen on a monthly basis. That because your time limit for availing credit is quite significant. For example, if you are procuring something in the month of uh, April two thousand twenty-two, uh, you have time up to September two thousand twenty-three to claim the credit. So therefore, the time is av always available to you to avail the credit. It never happens on a monthly monthly reconciliation. No, I think that's what uh, Raj's question is. So till uh, he is able to take credit, he'll be on a negative cash flow. Or, or because I would have paid him, sir. No? Ah, so I would, I would, I would look at it this way: if you have received the goods, if you receive the invoice, those are critical conditions to be met. Take the credit and watch the supplier to ensure that okay. he files his returns in time. Okay. Okay. We have to chase it. That means to file it. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. I think there's a question from Manush. I think he can go ahead. I'll also give you a method which some of the bigger players also adopt. What they do is they don't give the GST portion till their fellow files return. Yes. I, I've seen this. Actually, we came across a startup in IIT where we had done some consultancy. They, the guys paid the invoice uh, uh, withholding the GST. He said, once I see the... Uh, Thing in my thing only I'll pay. That's also a smart thing. <laughs> yeah, that's just already started. But but in a, for a very big company, it becomes difficult to mine it and manage. Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah. Anush, you had a question. You can hi, ask. hi. Good evening, sir. Yes, uh, so um, I I work in the restaurant space. I manage and run a couple of restaurants. Um, so here we are entitled to do only. Uh, we are entitled to charge only a five percent GST on customers right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are plenty of items on which I am charged like an 18%. So, uh, for, in for instance, on takeaway packaging material. So, on anything with relates to plastic, all of these boxes, etc., I pay an 18%. Uh, so, is there no way, and say for, for example, so in my restaurant itself, I, I know that, I know for a fact that there is a huge necessity uh, for takeaway packaging and material in the city. So what if I wanted to, you know, buy and resell pretty much in my restaurant itself, uh, the takeaway packaging, say I have a supplier who supply to me and I will resell to other people that I know. So if, if I do that through the restaurant, am I still, am I, because I pay 18% and am I allowed to charge 18% even though I'm a restaurant? I'll answer the question in two, two formats. One is first, let me explain to you why this 5% system came. Uh, I am not happy with the system. I, I com I'm completely against this five percent without ITC system because yeah, it, be, yeah. it, it defeats the whole uh, philosophy. Definitely, definitely. Now, why did it come? It came because GST became too popular. See, one seven two thousand seventeen when India saw GST, hmm. India also saw an interesting development. I would read it like this: the entire public bought into GST because it was so well packaged, so well talked about by everybody, and including Prime Minister Modi in such a manner that everybody knew about GST, everybody started talking about GST in their own way of whatever their knowledge is. And as a consequence of that, when hotels and restaurants were charging 18% GST, people started taking the photographs of the bills and posting in social media, saying that 18% GST for one packet of idli, one, one plate of idli, atrocious, this is GST is uh, too much, GST is costly, GST is prohibitive, etc., etc. And all kinds of bad name was created and negative publicity was created. Now, in the pre-GST regime, it is not as if this fellow was not paying this much of taxes. He was paying this taxes, but he didn't know. What happened was in the pre-GST regime, whatever the materials that were used in making the food items had an excise duty, were built into cost. So he could not see the excise duty. And there was an element of service tax as well as VAT on the transaction. VAT in some states was about 2%, some states was about 4%, 5%. Service tax about 6%. So there was already about 9 to 10% on the invoice and hidden cost about you know another 4% or 5%. So he was already paying this, but he didn't know about all that. GST became too popular. He got scared by the fact that 18% GST for a, or a plate of Italy and a coffee, etc. So it became so much of negative publicity that the government had to do something drastically. 
and they came up with the solution saying that we are cutting down the gst rates on foods and on hotels and restaurants so they brought it down to 5% and then they didn't want to give it without a control they said no it's now it makes tremendous sense for a small hotel or a mess which largely deals with products which don't attract gst for example ramen in the south indian food space it will do idli and dosa etc and uh, all the maavu or whatever they use for the products would not attract gst and therefore itc may not be a very critical requirement 5% is fine without itc but if you are a little more on the difference if you are in a multiple a different kind of cuisine you want some kind of uh, design and decor for a restaurant you have rentals which attract 18% gst you have air conditioning which attracts gst you have maintenance which attracts gst and you have fancy gadgets that are to be used in the kitchen you have to ensure that certain form certain kneading is done in a particular format certain spreading out is done in a particular format certain cooling equipments are required so all so all these things are a cost with, which comes with gst and then the packaging also has got a cost because the food has to be packaged and served in a very peculiar manner so what the government should have probably done in in my view is that they should have left it at the option they should have given two rates they should have said 12% with input tax credit 5% without input tax credit at your choice you take the choice at the beginning of the year so okay. that way people who don't want the itc can go for 5% and be happy about it people who want itc can jump at 12% and take the benefit of the credit so that is the ideal solution but unfortunately that is not it caught the imagination of the government despite a uh, uh, lot of people like us take talking about this quite often in the because we we are in that space so we, we have talked about that now coming back to your second question which is much more practical if you are in a position to trade and deal with the packing material you can very well trade and deal with the packing material charge that full rate of 18% on that and take the input tax credit maintain pakka separate accounts to ensure that you have two lines of revenue streams two lines of accounting two lines of costing one for the restaurant activity where whatever the inputs go into the restaurant activity don't even take credit and whatever right. goes into the trading activity take that credit in fact some of the restaurants are already doing it because restaurants have this uh, other business of uh, what do you call namkin they also Correct. have a outlet which sells packaged uh, namkin yes. and namkin attracts a higher rate of 12% on which itc is available so they are already maintaining accounts and that is being accepted got it so i you are suggesting saying basically i can do it but split my accounts completely yes make sure okay yeah. got it understood got it. Thank, thank you and what thank restaurants you. if i may ask um i run a middle eastern and a mexican one oh very good yes sir anush is also my son <laughs> oh that's nice hmm. mexe and mexe are the restaurants he is running they are quite popular hmm. <laughs> so now i think it's over to the floor any questions from anyone we can uh, ask so i i'm going to invite uh, mr singer to one our ex uh, CEO of IDC Limited, who is here in the. I hope he's here. I I cannot. Yes, yes. Yeah, single. Oh dear. Yeah, uh, Mr. Vaidhi Suren, uh, we had lot of interactions with you, and uh, you keep sending your mailers from time to time on all the changes. Thank you very much. Yes. And it's always wonderful to interact with you and uh, understand more about what's happening. Uh, uh, could you elaborate little on, uh, uh, you know, the taxis? what is the gst treatment they somebody charges 5% somebody charges more and uh, how does it work a tra- taxi operator for example uh, uh, you know if you if you hire a vehicle from a service provider how does it work what is the methodology for gst see this uh, rent a cab is i presume is what you're talking about yeah the yeah taxi is used for corporate businesses etc so right. the the way they've structured this is that if the rent a cab operator himself is in a position to he, he falls and let us say the unorganized category of, of being a non corporate entity he is a partnership firm or a sole proprietary or an aop or something like that then there is the option available whereby the corporate business entity which which avails the services can discharge gst at 5% under rcm and be done with it whereas if the service provider happens to be a non corp happens to be a corporate service provider a company by itself then it has to charge the 12% gst in respect of the rent a cab services why why it becomes a big issue because rent a cab service does not qualify as input tax credit for the business entity and therefore it's a cost under 175 there is a specific restriction 
and therefore companies tries to minimize the impact of this by trying to shift under reverse mechanism so if the more and more you choose your vendors who are in the unorganized sector you, you are able to go, go into the 5% stream whereas if you choose a vendor who's in the, who's unfortunately organized then you will have to charge you will have to get it cost of 12% but uh, you are not allowed to take a credit uh, your credit is not anyway not available so you just in both the situations in both, both situations. Okay. thank you sabina you wanted something huh? video this, see sometimes these distinctions are quite funny because this would actually make a, a, a service provider lose business and therefore he will say i would rather become a partnership firm or an individual to ensure that he doesn't lose the business take for example this auto after january 1st 2022 if you go on a road walking on a road and you look at an auto and call an auto then there is no gst but then you look go through your phone and book an auto then there is a gst <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah sir where is it available sir all the changes which has happened post 1st january i can share i can share my presentations with you, you can share with the participants sure sir thank you we will share it to everybody and i think sabina you wanted something you can ask uh sir how to learn or like what is gst 1 gst 2 like very basic uh, so i have just started my business uh, so i'm just struggling to learn and uh, struggling to file my uh, gst so how can or like where can we learn the basic ones i <laughs> see it's very sad that i have to give you this answer saying that by the time you learn the law will change overnight <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's so sad that you know we are having so many changes it, it i i hope and pray that the law settles down and they stop tinkering with the law so much and you know allow it to settle down but uh, most of these you can get through uh, there are a lot of faqs given by the government itself the, the board itself the cbic has come out with lot of faqs publications and uh, what do you call it e something flyers they they call it e flyers for each segment each sector each category these are available in the website of the uh, government cbic uh, you can just browse through it and see pick up what you can some of them have uh, uh, fairly simple questions and answers which you can easily get answered okay thank you sir uh, is it possible to share the link of uh, that website sir yes central board of indirect central board of indirect tax and custom cbic.org or G- cbic.gov.in okay sir thank you so one more uh, doubt uh, if you go and stay in a hotel i mean uh, obviously uh, for business reason people go and stay in the hotel and eat some food also uh, what is the treatment for uh, gst itc see if you are let us say you are headquartered in bangalore and your person travels to ahmedabad for some work and uh, the hotel charges gst and right. the hotel will charge the gujarat uh, sgst and cgst right. and uh, you will not be able to take the credit in bangalore so companies have tried to work around the situation by arriving at a centralized procurement uh, service provider whereby they would engage one person who would procure all these services and he would take those respective credits and charge igst on the uh, ultimate client so that they can take the credit but otherwise if you are directly dealing with the hotel then only if it's in your unless you are able to ensure that the booking is also done by the branch in that state and therefore the billing is done on that branch particular branch you will lose the cgst sgst as far as the accommodation is concerned food of course is completely lost in the sense that uh, the department believes that food and beverages falls under the restricted category and therefore not eligible i have a different view on it my view is that uh, food and beverages is the word used in the sections whereas what the uh, service that is availed is a restaurant service when you go to a hotel it charges gst under on the restaurant services and does not sell you food and beverages it actually provides a restaurant service and that is not a block credit but then that would be mind boggling litigation for a couple of years so unless you are very serious we, we people don't look at it okay thank you but this is quite sad no like you can't go and stay say in other yes. state and uh, not avail the gst it is unfair at least the cgst portion they should be able to give i don't know why they are not giving that no even the sgst because there must be some mechanism to allow the businesses to go and use it you cannot create a branch office for small businesses cannot do it <laughs> so the ideally the better solution would have been to look at it by saying that if the 
the place of supply provision should be simply tinkered then you can make it as an igst transaction right hmm. charge i think we have sir time for one last question i think one or two questions max just say you can ask the question yourself please uh, yes sir uh, sir uh, we are an association uh, a welfare association apartment welfare association and in that uh, uh, we are proposing on that 7500 because certain members come above 7500 uh, but uh, there are some exclusions that we can do uh, like some water bill and electricity bill can you give us some explanation sir because our water bill is one for the entire uh, uh, apartment but for common uh, for common area alone we have electricity uh, bill the other electricity bill is in the name of the owner of the flat so can we exclude that see it is like this electricity is outside gst water right. is exempt from gst and therefore it is very what do you say attractive to look at the proposition of eliminating electricity and water from the entire calculation while calculating 7500 it is possible provided it is like this the water which is identified per apartment if you are able to have metered consumption and then say <clears throat> that this much of water was consumed by this apartment the association incurred the overall water cost and recovering the proportionate cost based on metered consumption then we can say water is a reimbursement water can be kept out of the entire exercise but if it is not a proportionate cost I mean if it is not a, a metered cost but it is an allocated cost you incur the overall water expenditure <clears throat> and then allocate based on some square feet basis or something like that then you have a problem because the tax department's view is that you will not qualify as an exclusion okay sir okay thank you sir one question uh, uh, i am again rajesh Uh, sir actually uh, we are dealing in a industry where our outward supply is gst as well as well as non gst bill uh, actually we are dealing in petroleum industry so like ms hsd atf are non gst product other products are gst products so now actually there are certain stores and spares which we procure initially, initially we don't know uh, actually Uh, in which service it will be used like it will be used for mshsd tank or some other uh, products we are not aware so how to take itc on this uh, stores and spares see the the nexus test or the input tax credit test cannot be perpetual it has to be at the time of availment if you keep on up, applying the uh, input tax test there is no end to it so when i procured this goods when i procured those materials did i intend to use for my taxable gst business if the answer is yes i am entitled to input tax credit subsequently when i don't use it for that taxable business but i use it for some other activity which is not in the gst regime then rule 42 rule 43 calculations will take care of it so but there, there are revenue streams pertaining to exempt supplies there are revenue streams pertaining to non taxable supplies etc so the rule 42 and 43 which is calculate which is the input tax credit proportionate mechanism will take care of whatever that is required to be done when there are out, outward streams and that factoring alone is enough but sir that actually rule 40 to 43 we will apply at the i mean at the time of filing uh, returns hmm. like monthly return right. even at that time also we are not aware i mean uh, like so that, that year it escapes so what happens is that you have availed the credit it is standing in your itc in that rule 42 month or 12 months period you don't have this kind of transactions you have only taxable gst transactions and then nothing happens the input tax credit is fully utilized matter ends there next month when or next year or next financial year one transaction comes like this then your itc is overall will also be impacted by that rule 42 will take care of that so there are no more questions i think we can wind up thank you sir uh i i think you really covered uh, you know the great bit starting from residents welfare association to taxis to restaurants to you know uh, petroleum products i i tell you hats off to you and thank you so much for your patient uh, uh, patience and you know addressing all the questions and thank you sir we look forward to meeting you again soon thank you so much pleasure is mine thank you bye